Um, Where is she today? Right there. She's in here. Here you go, Donna Mae. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when the best way to put that in perspective for us guys, I think, is to think about how would they have turned out if it were just me? <laughs> we, we, you know, we're a team, we're a partnership, um, but, but I'm so thankful for all of the ways that she has instilled Christ and biblical values and accountability and integrity in their lives. So I love you, honey, and I'm thankful for the great mother that you are. And um, I think, you know, all of us guys, if we really think about it, we'd say we'd be in real trouble without mom. Um, when we look at these questions up here, we're going to kick off with this. I told you guys we would talk about situational ethics and we would talk about when God kills. So we'll do that one. We'll finish out with that one. These are some of the more just down-to-earth practical life discussions you have with people. Uh, is there such a thing as doing the wrong thing for the right reason? So let's start with that one and any thoughts you may have on that question. That, that question feels to me like a real... You have to really think about your response because you don't ever want to endorse or advocate doing the wrong thing for any reason. But when we look at the motives people have for doing what they do, are there occasions where something that we would normally say is wrong, such as telling a lie, are there occasions where someone might do that with a motive to do good? That's really what we're getting down to. When we are told to do something that is obviously and clearly against God's teaching and His will. Okay. Okay. Um, but what what are you getting at there specifically? There may be some times we have to not obey. Oh, okay, okay. I see where you're going. Yeah. Because we are admi we are admonished to obey authority. We are not only admonished to obey our parents in the Lord. We are also admonished to obey the governing authorities over us. So that's a good place to start. As a rule, we would say it, it's biblically correct to obey the authorities that are over you, even if those authorities are not overtly Christian, until they do what? Yeah, they try to force you to do something that is absolutely against God's commandments and His will. So if a child is old enough to reason and think and know that their parent is requiring of them, and, and hopefully this, you know, would would be rare, but I'm sure there are cases where the parent requires of the child to behave in ways that are contrary to the Bible. You know, I always think of Oliver Twist and Fagan. He wasn't their parent, but he was the closest thing they had to a parent. What was he teaching them to do? Steal. Yeah, yeah. So in a situation like that, you're supposed to obey your mom and dad, but what your mom and dad want you to do is wrong. Does the child draw the line and incur the consequences for doing so? Those are, there's, there's some situational ethics that are hard because what would I ca counsel the child to do? What I'd say, hey, your parent is asking you to steal, but you know it's wrong to steal. Therefore, you got to draw the line here, and then the child gets beat because they didn't obey. Now what have I done? You see, there's a dilemma there. Uh, ultimately, I, you know, I want to encourage the child to do the right thing, but I don't want the child to get in trouble. Uh, it, can, it can get a little dicey. What's, a, what's another situation where people might do what we would normally consider wrong for the right reasons. We're going to look at two big ones today. Anyone else got a, a thought on that? Does anybody feel like there are there are times like that? Well, as a teacher, I've lied to a mother before okay. about her daughter's grades because I found out that the child had been locked out of the house when she brought the a bad score. Okay. Um, it came back to me three days later. And so from that point, from that time on, I made very sure she got extra help on her work and mom wasn't, of course, right. Yeah. But um, we didn't send home report cards for that child. Okay. And we made notes where we needed to make notes. But that was a situation when she came back in and told us that she'd had to sleep on the porch. Mm -hmm. I went to the principal and said, we got to do something. And we did other things, too. But grades were never a priority with me anymore for her. You really made me think about the, the, where I am now at Lancaster. We have a lot more Spectrum kids. And the 
we find ourselves having to often make concessions against policy to make sure those kids yeah. are moved at a pace academically. I'm a special ed teacher. That's, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. And technically we're breaking the rules yeah. a lot of times, which there's a clause in there, you can't break the rules. And we're always telling people not to break the rules. But for this, our motive is what? What's our motive? What's well, Tammy's motive? To teach. I want them yeah. to learn. Yeah. And to not diminish the child. Yeah. So motive is the key word today. Huge. Yes, Kim. There's a couple others that I was thought of. One is yeah. killing in self-defense or defend your family. Mm. And the other one is lying or I just think it's about Nazi Germany when they lied about hiding the Jews. Mm -hmm. Those kind of situations. Oscar Schindler. We're going to talk about him right in there. Yeah, so there, there definitely are situational ethics. Uh, it's one of those things where, as, uh, as Christian apologists, we may have to agree to disagree on some of these. You know, whereas one person would say, well, I would never break that rule for any reason. Any reason, someone else might say, well, I would break it for this reason. And, and you got to look at the motives of the individual's heart. One, on one side, they're drawing a line and saying, I'm not going to break this rule because I believe it's wrong in every case. And other, and the other side, they're saying I am going to break it because I believe the greater good is this. And sometimes those two parties just won't land in the same place. It's not something we have to break fellowship over, but I do think it's a discussion it's worth having. Like Rahab, and she put the coin yeah. out and then said, "She's in the, <laughs> she's in the presentation." What did, what did Rahab do that we would normally say is wrong? Lie. Lie. Yeah, she bore false witness which is in the Ten Commandments, not to do. Why did she lie? She didn't know about the Ten Commandments. Well, yeah, she didn't know about the Ten Commandments yet, but yeah. What, 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 was, her, what was her motive? And when we read Scripture, how did God look on that? It looks like he looked on that as something she was right to do. So yeah, that's that's a huge one. Um, I include this example just because you know the coal miners of the uh, of the fifties, and there may be many other examples comparable to this. Um, subjecting yourself to work conditions, which will inevitably kill you and take you from your family, which a lot of people would counsel you not to do, but you're doing it to provide for your family. Subjecting yourself to conditions that are detrimental to you so that you can do good for others. Okay, it's a situational ethic because some would say, don't do that, that's dangerous, that's detrimental. These guys couldn't just up and run and change careers you know, in, in the state of things we're in uh, in this time. And so, you know, that's one thing to think about. Um, now, on that same, on that same note, um, there was a ministry that our, my in-laws went to a church and there was a ministry to strippers, a strip club, okay? It wasn't the men going, I don't ever recommend that, guys. If they say, hey, we got a ministry to strippers and we need these men to go down, don't do it, okay? <laughs> um, it's not a situational ethic. <laughs> um, but the women went and uh, they, what'd they do, hun? They brought them gift cards, uh, loved on them, invited them out to lunch, and eventually some of these girls, you know, began to come, become part of the church and decided to make some changes in their lives, which was, you know, that was, that was a ministry. They wrote a book about it. Um, and I think there was some different thoughts. Should we be doing this? Should, should the church even be associated with this? Um, should we be allocating our resources to this? Because all these ladies don't end up coming to church and getting saved and changing their direction. Um, should we approach it very aggressively with, Hey, you know, our, our whole goal here is for you to become a Christian, and you'll continue to receive this support if you do. And if you don't become a Christian, you're not going to continue to receive this support. All these kind of thoughts and conversations. Um, Jim Ranke had a documentary on, um, I can't remember what it was on, maybe Netflix, where he brought all these homeless people into church, and a lot of people in the church were like, this is not good, this is creating all kind of problems. Other people were like, we ought to do this. So situations like that, where what's being done motive-wise is being done to help people who are in need or people who are stuck in some kind of profession that's detrimental to them and, and allocating resources to help them. But then the other side is, is that, is that a, 
biblical, godly way to allocate resources, and should we be helping people who could potentially be problematic to us when we bring them in? There are all these. You guys see where I'm going with all that? You know, we got we got people all around us. Steve's been talking about it. You know, we got to get out in this community. We got to make a difference in the community. That doesn't just that isn't just a, a super clean, easy thing always. Um, do you give the people with the cardboard signs money, or do you not give them money? You know, is, is the system of all that broken? And, and if someone does give them money and they go buy beer with it, how does God weigh the motive of the person's heart? You know, did I give them money to make myself feel better because I need to feel like I did something? Or did I give them that money really hoping and wanting for them to go get food for themselves and their family? And are they telling the truth with those cardboard signs? You guys see where I'm going? Mm -hmm. Right? All of these things. We want to do good. When, when you read the Bible, it does seem like the poor were easier to distinguish and those who are in need than it is today. It feels a lot more complex today. And whereas as a younger man, I gave quite a bit of money and time and resources and put people up in hotels and bought them food. I do a little less of that today. Anybody want to guess why? But you have a family, you have to take care of first. Well, yeah, that, the resources are, are less. Um, you get burned a lot. Got, got burned a lot, got burned a lot. I'll always remember, um, you know, giving money to some guys. I think I brought them some Subway, but I also gave them some money uh, and, and, you know, saw them later in the day and guess what they had. You know, and it's just like, and then putting some, putting a man who came regularly to the church when I was at Valley Station, Kentucky, putting him up in a hotel that he always needed a place to stay, and then finding out he'd done some things there that, you know, were, were not good. And just, uh, you know, you're young, you're, you know, you're naive, you just feel like you're helping people. But then kind of weighing, am I doing this to make sure that I feel like my conscience is good, or am I doing this to really help them? And you hope you hope your um, your heart is right in that, but all of those all of those are situational ethics. You know, could it be just as ethical not to help as it is to help? Like by helping, are we creating the problem of the cardboard sign? That you know what I'm saying? Have you guys ever seen that there's there's people with the sign and they've got a family out there and sometimes a dog out there, and then you'll come by two or three days later. It's the same sign, but it's different people. Or it's the same parents of different kids. I've noticed this before. And I'm like, is there a network here? And where are these people going and where do they live? And I've been told that sometimes they live fairly elaborately because there's a network and collect of the resources. So you don't know, you don't know how to trust the people that you want to help, right? And that would be the case with getting heavily into a homeless uh, situation, you know, ministering to those who are in various professions. The, ultimately what I want to say today and we'll keep coming back to this what's the motive of our heart when, when we help I really think that's what God looks at they have to deal with how they receive the help that's between them and God but what's between us and God is our discernment and the motive behind what, whereby we would help so um, that, is, that is one that we cover when we do social issues when I teach class as a rule, we'd say don't do that, okay? Are there situational ethics wrapped up in that sometimes in cases of abuse? Um, you know, we know the biblical outs are infidelity and abandonment. But are there cases that don't involve infidelity or and at least physical abandonment that are still something we would, we might as Christians counsel somebody, get out of there. Abuse, you know, physical abuse, particularly. Yeah, even though that's not particularly mentioned in scripture as a as a qualification for divorce, right? So that can be there can definitely be situational ethics there. You know, one could argue that a, abuse is a form of emotional abandonment. You know, there there when you get into situa situational ethics, there's a lot of semantics and mental gymnastics to understand why something that would normally be construed as wrong might not be wrong in this case. And our legal system deals with that, don't they? When you're in a court of law, and boy, you're, you're trying to
prove that in this particular case, what was done was not a crime, we better get your ducks lined up morally. Can we, what? Skip, can we skip this one? <laughs> Are you guilty, Michael? Mm. Okay. Wait, no. <laughs> I'm not guilty right at this moment, no. <laughs> As a rule, of all of you drive the speed limit. I know that about you because I know what kind of people you are. Okay. But there might be an occasion where you would exceed the speed limit. What for a motive that's noble, which would be what? Medical emergency. the other way. Yeah. Oh, I mean, trying to save a life, trying to get somewhere to do good because it's you know the clock's ticking. Get get Mother's Day lunch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got to get to that. Yeah. Uh, pregnant woman's in the car. Um, you know, uh, all kind of things. And the police will help you out a lot of times. But they'll they'll help you break the law if the reason for breaking the law is justified. Okay. That one's a little bit easier. Um, again, you got to really if you're going you know 65 and a 30 because officer, I'm going to be late to work and integrity demands that I be on time. You know, that'd be different than trying to save somebody, get somebody to the hospital. So, so are you thinking situational ethics and absolute truth are unrelated? That government, Michael. Sorry, that's yeah. a loaded question. Did y'all hear his question? Are situational ethics and absolute truth unrelated? I, I guess my where I initially how I would respond to that is. The absolute truth of a situational ethic depends heavily on the motive of the person's heart. Is that a fair way to answer? Yeah, but I think the other side would use that same argument yep. as to why they would say that you know, abortion or whatever else is okay. Right, and they, and they can. And, and that's where biblical morality plays heavily into that discussion. So the in the situation of abortion, you're going to deal with cases of rape. They're going to bring that up. Cases where it's the mother or the child, okay. And you're going to make the you're going to make the point that this is that those are extremely rare in the percentile as why. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to move that discussion to what the majority of the of abortions are because of why. Marketing. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I don't want to take the responsibility. The preventative measures, I want that to be uh, a form of birth control. To when we put it in the category, okay, if you were just having irresponsible sex and you were relying on abortion to bail you out if you're not ready for the child, but you were perfectly willing to do what it takes to conceive a child, we'd place that in the immoral, wrong, evil category. Okay, If that's the situation, if the situation is the husband has to choose between the mother and the child's life, that is a completely different motive. So you, I do think that when you're talking about absolute truth, you can always bring the discussion back to motive to assess, was this right or wrong? I really do. You know, people may not agree, but in, in the case of here, for example, you killed to preserve life, freedom, and justice, or you killed because you were angry. You know, you're always assessing motive. You aborted to you aborted to save a life, or you aborted to, um, what was the other case I used? Uh, you know, there were, there were cycles, I don't know. Right. Abortion's tough, because no matter how you slice it, when you abort, you're terminating a life. If you understand that life is life at conception, then no matter what you do, you're terminating a life. So there, with the exception, even in the case of rape, you're gonna say, don't abort the child, the child's innocent. But they're going to fire back with what? It was a terrible experience. For You're not here. You don't have to carry that child for nine months. Mm -hmm. You don't know what it's going to do to that young lady, right? To, to which I would probably come back with, it's still the termination of an innocent life, but I am going to approach this with kid gloves, understanding that they are correct. I do. It, that is not my body, and that is not some, a trauma that I went through. So you need to be very gentle. Even if you're making the case, please don't kill the child. Right, and, and and again, her motive is different than a young lady who just wanted to party and have a good time. Oh, you know, I, you know, I got knocked up at a party. I'm going to get an abortion, as opposed to a young lady who's contemplating it because she was taken advantage of. Yeah. 
Yeah, <clears throat> real case, I guess, in, in uh, Ukraine, right? Russian soldiers are raping women. The women are giving up the babies to adoption. Mm. Yeah, they have a choice. Of, to let the baby live. Yeah. Yeah. To, and, and people would say that's noble. Yeah. And people would say, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to carry that, you know. And, you know, we, we, sanctity of life there is always the motive we're going to come back to. And, and really, that's the motive here, too. Sanctity of life. You know, the, to, to kill, to preserve the life of your family, your loved ones, to preserve the life of innocence, such as in a school shooting situation, is your motive for killing was to preserve life. Okay? To kill just out of anger, uh, out of malice where that killing was not necessary, regardless of what the individual you killed may have done, is a completely different situation. Here, you may have heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in World War II was a, was a German pastor who was part of a clandestine group who was plotting the assassination of Adolf Hitler. That is widely discussed in the church even today. He was a pastor but he was plotting the assassination of a despot to do what? What was Bonhoeffer's motive? Why did he think that was right? We've got to stop it. Yeah. We've got to stop this evil. And ultimately, you know, the United States government, of course, they were going to, if we could get a shot at him, we were going to get a shot at him. You know, that was overt. But they were clandestine because had they been caught, Right there, and, and they and they did get caught, and, and uh, you know, they were all uh, executed. Um, there's a Tom Cruise movie, Valkyrie, where you know similar, right. some of his own people. Now there are Christians who would say, doesn't matter. They were they were plotting murder. No matter what Hitler was doing, they were plotting to assassinate another human being, and that's just wrong. Other Christians would say. Their whole reason for plotting to do that was to preserve thousands of lives. You see? Situational ethics. It's not always easy. It's not always cut and dry. It's not always a conversation where even believers land in the same place. But they're there, and as apologists, we want to at least be equipped to have the conversations. Um, I'm, if y'all just want to, I'm going to err on the side of Bonhoeffer, I'll be honest with you. And if I'm wrong, may God forgive me. But I'm going to take the life to try to preserve lives. Assassination, that gets a little more dicey than just killing in wartime. Okay, yes, sir. It's interesting it's the situation like that. <coughs> yeah. Just described as people that call it abortion clinics. <laughs> yeah. And feel justified in doing it. So. Feel justified in doing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to weigh in on that one? Go that far. Ooh. You want to weigh in on that one? I was going to say a different example. Okay. Finish that one now. Come back. Okay. Anybody want to weigh in on the? You know, these abortion doctors are going to keep killing babies. We're going to have to kill the doctors, or... How yeah. many can argue you're pro-life, then, if you're killing them? Right. Right. Yeah, I muddy the water a little bit further, I guess, is that, uh, you know, that's a potential life that they're taking, or a potential human that they're taking. We don't know where this sense of humanness comes in. It's a life, but we take life all the time when it comes to a bird or an animal. So, um, kind of muddies the water there. Yeah, and I think in the case of trying to kill the doctor or destroying property or equipment, you're ultimately what you have to know is that's not going to change anything. That's just going to make matters worse. That's not the answer. T taking life in that fashion. It's not the same as wartime. So that'd be a big discussion to have. What was your sir? I was just thinking about World War II, and yeah. you know, it's, it's easy. I, I watched Valkyrie the other day. Interesting. Oh, did you? Pretty okay. good movie. Yeah. Um, thinking about, you know, it's it's easy for me to line up against Hitler and go, okay, clearly this is, you know, it seems to be justifiable. And hey, Bonhoeffer did it, one of the greatest disciple makers of all time. Now, it must have been right. You know, what if you're Harry Truman and you see the the, the war in the Pacific going so terribly in this island to island, you know. Um, the Japanese absolutely refusing to surrender under any condition, and so Truman decides to stop to drop two nuclear bombs, killing tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people, most of whom were not combatants, you know, they're civilians, with the argument of I'm gonna save millions of lives in the long term and bring the war to a close. Now that's a very difficult call to argue one way or the other. 
It's a great I, point. I, I don't know what I don't know what the right thing to do there was. There's a movie, uh, Michael Douglas and Annette Benning, The American President. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you all seen that one. Mm -hmm. My favorite scene in that film is he's sitting in the room with his, his uh, advisors, his cabinet, and in the Middle East there's been a, a skirmish or something and he has to make the decision to hit a bunker or a facility or something of that nature. And Michael J. Fox is in that movie and he tells him, that, you know, or no, it's not Michael J. Fox, it's another, another one of his advisors, but anyway, he, the guy tells him what he did is, is good, it'll, it'll win voting points, it was very presidential. And you know, Michael Douglas is a good actor, and you can see how distraught he is at that statement. He says, uh, he says, Leon, understand that miles from where we're sitting, there's a, a night janitor who works at this, this bunker facility, and he's just going about his business. Uh, he doesn't know that in this amount of time, his life will be terminated because I just gave an order to drop a bomb on that facility. He's not even part, he said, what I've just done is the least presidential thing I do. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. So this is what Trey brings up. You got, and, and then you know people are going to talk about God and Genesis and you know wiping out the the Canaanites and, and the Amalekites and all these these kinds of things. They're going to assess that. And we talked about how God knows the motive of those hearts. He knows what those hearts are going to be. That's God. But when we do it as a government and we wipe out thousands of people because it's a wartime decision to prevent what we believe is a, come, a growing evil to prevent something we believe will kill us, you still got innocence involved. And we as humans can't say, well, we know what they would have grown up to become. God can say that. God can kill in that respect, but we're in a different category. That's why we're going to do next week, God kills, because it's a little a different category of what we do. Um, people who do kill, even for home defense, wartime, you know they go through extreme trauma and PTSD. Snipers, uh, some of the worst PST, PTSD military snipers, because why? Very personal. Yeah. It's their job, but then they also have a conviction. <laughs> <coughs> Police. Uh, situations where intelligence said these little boys coming to this village peddling wares sometimes have bombs strapped to them. So if you see that, you have to execute, only to find out the little boy was peddling wares. You don't know. You can't let him get inside to the compound with trench coat on. Or police, the little boy had a squirt gun. Police thought it was a real gun. Again, though, what was the motive? You go through the PTSD, and I killed an innocent life, and I, I feel like a horrible, awful person, but you didn't take that life out of malice. I'm not justifying it, I'm not saying it's right, I'm just saying, the motive of your heart was to preserve life and freedom and justice. The motive of your heart wasn't to take a life, but it gets really muddy. It can get really ugly and complicated, especially in, in that area. Would you say <clears throat> that there is like a black and white right and wrong and the main thing that would differentiate and make shades of gray is motive? Exactly. That's, that's foundationally where we land in situational ethics is motive. The, the only time it goes gray is when we do what is you typically per, considered to be right. We, we, we go against that to do what we think is the greater good. That was the motive of our heart. We're going to look at some more situations. What about that one? That's not a healthy yelling. If I'm yelling at my kid to get out of the road when a car is coming, if I'm yelling at my dog, which happens a lot when he runs across my neighbor's yard, I don't know if the dog is the same as the person, but neighbors will too. Well, I don't yell though, like I loudly call them. But like, I see children yelling at each other, like no. in their faces. <laughs> like, very, very disturbing. Yeah. Yeah, so mine don't always get along. Shop. Okay. So if that's Belle and that's me, she's been mean to her sister, and I'm excessively attacking her, yelling at her about that. That would not, I would put that in the wrong, bad parenting category. If she has um, been consistently stealing, and I'm on my wits end with her, 
and I don't know, I don't know what else to do. You can't do this anymore. They're going to take you away from us. I, I don't know that yelling is, do you understand like the motive of a parent to yell or anybody to yell? Okay. It's Mother's Day and we, you know, we're fortunate to have mothers in here who have never yelled at their husbands. No, but that's not true of everyone. Hey, let me just go see Michael. Okay. Right? It's very rare that she's ever had to yell at me. She had to raise her voice on a few occasions. Okay. But sometimes it's it's necessary. What do you think? Or it's never necessary to yell. Yelling is emotional. Yeah. I mean, Your pastors do it. In the last couple of weeks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you get know, the point yeah. across, right? It gets your attention just like a child. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you almost got to yell for yeah. them to understand yeah. what you're saying. Remember when he ran out on the road when he was little? You do not ever run out of the road again! <laughs> okay. I came out of fear for you. Yeah. You were fearful. Yeah. I was not fearful. Yeah. So your response yeah. is to fear. His. I don't know what you're talking yeah. about. I was just running. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yelling in that case may not have been the best, but a lot of people could say, I, under, I get it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's why it's a situational ethic. It's, I think it's you realize after you do that as a parent that you think, oh, and then you go back and sit down and yeah. say, I shouldn't have responded that way, yeah. no matter what it is. That's yeah. when you're doing okay parenting, you know, where you are able to recognize that I should have handled it differently. So curious, the people in this room, that you've ever yelled and, and regretted it after. Okay. <laughs> Hands down. You've ever yelled and it, it needed to be done. Okay. So it's situated depending on your motive, depending on the situation, that's all the situational ethics. That one helps us to, to understand that a little bit better. Any more on that one? The only thing is yes, for yelling, I think, is if that's your modus operandi or whatever the words are. That's, that's bad, obviously. Yeah. You know, it should be atypical. Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, this one we kind of touched on. Rahab lied to save the spies, and we see that you know what she was doing was to preserve the life of God's people. So it was looked upon favorably. As a rule, we don't bear false witness. Um, Tammy, you know, your motive was to love that child. Oh man, you know, fudging books, fudging records, uh, not giving a completely honest answer to a question because we're trying to, uh, I don't know, we're convert somebody's feelings. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's the old adage, uh, honey, how does this dress look? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, it looks beautiful. Everything you wear, look, you look beautiful. Which is true, right, gentlemen? All the time, right? <laughs> and my wife really does. She, she could put on a potato sack and she would still look gorgeous. <laughs> so anyways um, there are um, Santa Claus yeah that's great what's the motive Easter buddy what's the motive what are they <laughs> when, the, when the child really believes those things are true and, and I know Christians who are divided on this we don't do Santa Claus it's lying to our children which how can I argue against that? We did Santa Claus. So we lied to them until they figured it out. People say, that's terrible. Other people would say, no, that's, you know. Theocratic tact. You're going to have to elaborate. Yeah. Now you're out of my wheelhouse. Um. Sometimes Jehovah's Witnesses will uh, say things that are that they know are untrue. Okay. They call that theocratic attack. Okay. Yeah. Straw man arguments and things like that. Well, yeah, even more than that. But yeah. Hmm. They say things they know that aren't true. What's their motive? Well, they want to convince you that to be a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah, that's that's the tactic. You okay. So, so my question there would be if, if you're talking about witnessing. Or winning people over to your persuasion of faith. If if I have to do be dishonest to get you there, yeah. then I got a question. What do I really believe? That's that that's a whole other category of thought. Yeah. If I have to manipulate or trick you to get you to become to Christ, 
what in the world had happened that we had to employ those tactics. Right. Yeah, wow. Now, and I will say that in our Southern Baptist life, it, it probably has been done that people were, you know, it's the old, you know, Turner burn, the hellfire brimstone. That is, I don't know if that's a theocratic tactic, but it's a manipulative Kind of the whole focus on if you don't get right with Christ, you're going to hell, which we know from Scripture is true. And and if the motive of my of my heart is really to win them to Christ, in my personal opinion, there's so many other things I can say about Jesus than just trying to scare them to death. Mm-hmm. Right? right? If if the motive of my heart is I got to produce, I'm under pressure from my diocese or whatever to get this many converts in a year. Okay then I might use hell when my quota is down. Does that make any sense? Mm-hmm. We had a thing, I don't know if you guys remember it, I feel like it was around 2011, 2010, I went to the SBC, um, that was probably 20, 2009, 2010, I was a pastor at the time. I just remember going and there was this big push to go to lower income housing places and to have revival services to get baptisms up. But the big question a lot of the pastors have was, where's all the follow-up? Where's the discipleship follow-up? How are we going to plug these people into the local church? How are we going to begin it? There wasn't a whole lot of plan for that. We just really needed to see baptisms come up because baptisms were down. It's like, okay, the motive to get baptisms up can be beautiful and great if you want them to get baptized because you're bringing them into the fellowship of Christ and you're going to disciple them now. The motive to get baptisms up, if it's about the chart... You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Oh, we're down in baptisms. We need to look like, right? It's like, ugh. Man, I, until you brought that up, I, never, I didn't even think about including something like that, but that can get dicey as well. What's our motive for wanting to grow? What's our motive for wanting to multiply? Has any church ever been guilty of wanting to multiply because it looks great and it brings in more money? Or have all churches everywhere of all time always only wanted to multiply to increase the kingdom? What was the motive? Only God knows for sure, right? But boy, you talk about Laodicea and, Th- and Sardis and Thyatira. You guys know what I'm talking about? Pergamum. He had stuff to say to those churches, didn't he? Over here, you're doing really well. But over here, you know, there's some things that need work. And the motives got mixed up even in the earliest days of the church. So... All of these, would you say all of those have a situational ethic somewhere in them, can or they can have? Yeah, I got called on one of them on abortion. Really, uh, my wife had a miscarriage. Okay. And a DNC that followed that. Okay. And and this guy uh, said, "Well, Glenn, you don't believe in abortion, but you just had one." So. My retort after a fashion was, well, that was to save the life of my wife. Oh. Yeah. But, uh, it's completely different than, than the average. Well, it's different, but it's not a living life. Yeah, it's not a living life. Right. Right. Um, we've talked about abortion. What's a situational ethic in substance abuse? Well, I mean, they could be uh, prescription, basically uh, introduced, and now they're addicted. Yeah. Right. And it's not going to be an easy fix just to go, yeah. and, and any really any kind of addiction, drug addiction. Yeah. Yeah. But that you know it, that'd be a really hard one to make an excuse for as a rule. Yeah. You know, I need to drink for this reason. Can understand tapering back, yeah. but the goal is ultimately to get clean and get well. Um, what will they say here? I was born that way. How can you tell me to go against? They will say, you're heterosexual. Could you just go against that? Because all of a sudden you found out that was not the right way to go. What do you, how do you come against that? The person has to accept their statement's true. Right. Yeah. Which you, you wouldn't. No. Found foundationally, biblically, they will use situational ethics, but that one would be really there's not really a biblically there's not really a case to be made. There's no whereas we have Rahab the prostitute story, we don't have any kind of story where that was necessary for any reason. And it's always only ever prohibited. 
so whereas that's not going to be the popular opinion in some circles that's a very that's not one that a situational ethic can really justify that for any reason at any time amongst any people but they will they will play that card okay what about this one you know I cheated so that I could get the good grades so that I could get into a good school, so that I could get the good job, so I could provide well for my family. So ultimately, it was good that I cheated. Because <laughs> my motive was to provide for my family. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't fly? It doesn't work? Okay, all right. You see, people can play. You know, you, once you let it out there that ethics can be situational, people can take that and run in, in, in a not good direction with it. Um, that would, in some cases of that, Maybe it would fall in the same category as lying. Uh, you know, the only reason I did that was to, my motive was to help or preserve or to, to save, you know, to, to hide something that, you know, was going to save life, whatever. You know, I, when, you, uh, when you misrepresent documents, when you misrepresent uh, information, cheating, lying, you know, the words all get muddled. But what, what was your motive for doing that? You know, thoughts on that one? I don't know that you could justify that in the classroom. I don't know that you could justify that in marriage. There's not really a situational ethic that would allow you to do that, where that would be looked upon as favorable, unless it's a case where you're trying to save lives. You're trying to protect people. Okay. So there it is. First Timothy 5 8, if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than a what? Infidel. Worse than an infidel. Um, so if people go to great lengths, what about, so swinging back, what about the stripper who told the people from the church, this is the only way that I'm ever going to be able to provide for my children. I'm a single mom. I'm not going to make this money anywhere else. I don't have the education. And it's the only way I'm going to be able to put money back for their college. Now, if she's sincere in that, her motive is not to strip. Her motive is to provide for her children by this profession, which she has discovered, this is where I'm going to make the most money. Okay? To which you want to acknowledge the noble motive. At the same time, what was the church trying to do? We don't, we don't believe that's the only way. We're going, to, we're going to befriend you. We're going to love you. We're going to help you and try to lead you to a place where this lifestyle, you know that it is escapable and you can still meet these goals in ways that don't. I think that was the motive of the church. You know, so you've got, you know, the stripper has her motive, but the church's motive is we're going to try to move you, we're going to try to help you, we're going to try to redirect you in a way that is not diminishing you. Okay? And then those kind of things. So we've talked about that. Have y'all seen that movie? He would not, uh, Corporal Dawes, um, what is it called? Hacksaw Ridge? Would not take up a firearm. He would only bring his Bible. That was situational ethic. Putting putting all of us at risk by not taking up that firearm. And then on the other side, but he has these personal biblical convictions. He's willing to do everything that it takes to contribute medically. He's a medic. But he's just not going to take up a firearm, which is his company men had a real problem with. You know, if we need him to have a firearm in a certain situation and he doesn't have one. All of us are at risk. You see their motive? You see his? He felt that conviction from God. He ended up saving a bunch of them. Never picked up a weapon. But it's a, it's a good film to watch if, uh, you, know, if you really want to assess the, the situational ethics. But yeah, Jesus, most arguments we have are not about freedom or preservation of life, but about the defense. You know, when God killed, we'll get into that. The only reason God ever killed was to defend you know, those who were innocent. Uh, yeah, we talked about that just now. Now, the Bible prohibits those things. Yes. Okay. And the motive of a lot of people in those things is very evil, very wicked, it's very pleasure-based, very dopamine-based. But not all of them. Okay. So our motive would acknowledge their motive and then try to move them in a direction that delivers them from the bondage that is these things. Okay. You know, DC talk. Is that for me? DC talk. 
Mm -hmm. From Mary and Ego? Okay. They did a song, My Worldview. It's how I see the world. It's how I look at you. Understand back to when we originally started this class, we talked about presuppositions. We talked about opinions. We talked about preferences. And we talked about worldview. Lens. The way I see the world, the way I see other people, the way I weigh motive is particular to my worldview. That's how I see you. So it, that's another step. When I'm weighing motive, I want to do that biblically. I also want to understand the way I understand people's motives is unique to the way I interpret the world and my worldview. So I want to keep all of that in mind heavily when assessing situational ethics. What was right, what was wrong, what should have been done, what could have been done in this situation, depending on what the situation is, okay? There, folks, listen, I want to say that the majority of situations when you talk about biblical morality versus the morality of the world, it, it, it's not always that difficult. You know, it's, um, as a rule, we know that telling the truth is the right way to go. Integrity, lack of integrity will destroy us integrity will elevate us. As a rule, we know that's foundationally true. But when people don't use integrity for reasons that are attached to a noble cause, that's when we get into a situational ethic. The, uh, the story there I heard while I was in grad school, uh, one of our professors had been on a mission trip and they, they were coming back to the place where they were staying and there was a, a woman on the steps proselytizing. And they were missionaries. And one guy said, hey, look, there's a prostitute. And the other guy goes, no, that's a person who's in prostitution. What's the difference? Maybe she was trafficked or something into it. She didn't know it was wrong. Who knows? That's a person. That's the key. Yeah, one of them's right. That's the key. That's the person. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the statements, I don't think, are necessarily situational. She's not a prostitute. That doesn't, the, what she's doing there doesn't define who she is as a human being. I really think the other guy was right in every circumstance. She's a human being, made in the image of God, but she's stuck in prostitution. And, and it could be a variety of reasons why. Maybe she chose it. Maybe she was sold into it. You, you know, guys, in some of these places in the world, these young girls grow up in that. It's all they ever know. And they're made, they're made to believe that's all they're ever going to do. It's the only way for them to ever eat or be provided for or cared for so you know man as a bible believing christian oh well watch out for that bad prostitute and my motive for doing that might be to not be tempted and not not to you know get caught up in the you know the with the wayward woman but i have completely missed the fact that she's made in the image of god if I don't at least stop to consider out of my presuppositions, yeah, but this is a human being right here. And then I have to remember, how did Jesus treat these people? And he got in trouble for that. It's one of the reasons they wanted to kill him. That was part of a long list of 